All right, well, welcome everyone into our uh, February the 11th reading. And um, I hope that uh, today you will uh, try to make sure that you uh, you jump into church somewhere. And uh, if you don't have a church, if you can't make it to church, obviously you are always invited to uh, to join me um, online. You can go to ProvidenceWesleyanChurch.com and you can see the live stream that uh, that publishes. We, we start at 9 a.m., our first service, and uh, you can always watch it afterwards as well. Uh, we're in a series on miracles, and uh, uh, tomorrow I'll be preaching about the woman who is healed uh, from her bleeding, from 12 years of bleeding. And uh, so it's going to be a going to be a powerful message. And so I hope that you will join us or that you'll join somebody, some church somewhere in uh, in worshiping God. There's a few things that we learn about God as we've been reading along and we see God establishing these, uh, you know, these um, rules of worship, instructions for worship, I guess, I think is, is it probably a better way of, of putting it, not rules so much. I mean, they are. But just instructions. And what do we learn about God? And the whole Bible is about learning, learning about who God is and learning about ourselves and about the condition of the world. And so we learn, we've learned a few things already. We learn, first of all, that God is holy, right? God is holy. He's a holy God. And he calls it the second thing, he he wants us to be holy. He wants us to uh, to understand the difference, you know, um, for us to, to um, have our sin taken care of, right? Uh, the third thing, I, we learn the difference between the the common and the or and the or the common, the ordinary, and the uncommon or the sacred. And there's such a difference. There, there's a there's a difference between that which is common and what is sacred to God. Okay, and so we're we're really learning about those things. Okay, so don't get bogged down in in some of the things that God establishes for the Israeli people as far as just the you know, the sacrifices and the, the sprinkling of blood and stuff like that, you know, sometimes we can see that and miss the bigger picture of what it is that God is doing with his people and what he's trying to get across to us. Um, even that, uh, you know, God, there, there is such thing as sacred and there's the common and there is holy and unholy. And God wants us to, to work and work hard, but he also wants us to make sure that we have, we, we we rest from our work and we understand that we live under the goodness of God in his provision, even like, you know, the sixth day, uh, you know, the Israelites, when they went out to collect the manna, what were they doing? They went out to collect the manna and God provided enough manna on the sixth day for them to be able to have for two days. And he didn't do that all the rest of the week. That's incredible, isn't it? And then all the rest of the week, if they let it, you know, uh, whatever was left over in the morning, the next day, it it have turned to maggots. But it didn't do that on the on the seventh day, you know, when when they had collected double the amount on the you know for uh, on the on the sixth day enough for the sixth day and the seventh, then it didn't turn to make it. Make it. So it's just incredible, isn't it? And the point is, is that God's our provider, right? God's our provider, and we could try and work our hard and and even make every day the same and work seven days and and you know still not seem to get ahead and lose sight. Of what's most important you know so there's a lot of things that we're learning in the old testament that really these kind of big picture uh things and and that's what i want to encourage you to do is try to get the big picture of what is it that god is trying to get across to his people and even trying to get across to us okay so let's move into february 11th and um and so let's pick it up moses has been up on mount sinai god's been giving him instructions about worship and Getting, gives him the Ten Commandments and the tabernacle and all of those things. And this is what happens. He finishes up. When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. Okay, Again, remember, God's, God's got, brought them out of Egypt, but God is still trying to get Egypt out of them. Much of like what happens with us when we give our lives to Christ. You know, we, we come out of the world, but God's trying to get the world out of us. Okay. And so he continues on. So Aaron said, well, take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. All the people took the gold rings from the ears and brought them to Aaron. And then Aaron took the gold, melted it down, molded it into the shape of a calf. And when the people saw it, they exclaimed, O oh, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Whoa, just for a minute. 
What a slap in the face to God. God brings them out. And what do they do? Oh, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Aaron saw how excited the people were, so he built an altar in front of the calf. And then he announced, tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. And people got up early the next morning to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. And after this, they celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. And the Lord told Moses, quick, go down the mountain. Your people whom you brought from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. How quickly... They have turned away from the way I commanded them to live. They have melted down gold and made it a calf, and they have bowed down and sacrificed to it. They are saying, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And then the Lord said, I have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Now leave me alone so my fierce anger can blaze against them, and I will destroy them. Then I will make you, Moses, into a great nation. Uh, Moses in this moment, he's got a, he's got a, a choice here. It's interesting. God says, I'm, I'm just going to destroy him and I'll start over again. And Moses, I'm going to start with you. See how Moses responds. But Moses tried to pacify the Lord as God. Oh, Lord, he said, why are you so angry with your people whom you brought from the land of Egypt with such great power and such a strong hand? Why let the Egyptians say their God rescued them? with the evil intention of slaughtering them in the mountains and wiping them from the face of the earth. Turn away from your fierce anger. Change your mind about this terrible disaster you have threatened against your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You bound yourself with an oath to them saying, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven. And I will give them all this land that I have promised to your descendants, and they will possess it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the terrible disaster he had threatened to bring on his people. Then Moses turned and went down the mountain. He held in his hands the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. These tablets were God's work. The words on them were written by God himself. When Joshua heard the boisterous noise of the people shouting below them, he exclaimed to Moses, it sounds like war in the camp. But Moses replied, no, it's not a shout of victory, nor the wailing of defeat. I hear the sound of a celebration. And when they came near the camp, Moses saw the calf and the dancing, and he burned with anger. He threw the stone tablets to the ground, smashing them at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf they had made and burned it. Then he ground it into powder, threw it into the water, and forced the people to drink it. And finally he turned to Aaron and demanded, What did these people do to you to make you bring such terrible sin upon them? Don't get so upset, my lord, Aaron replied. You yourself know how evil these people are. They said to me, Make us gods who will lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So I told them, well, whoever has gold jewelry, take it off. When they brought it to me, I simply threw it in the fire <laughs> and out came this calf. What a cop out. Uh, he threw it in the fire and then he molded it. He shaped it. He made the calf and then he made the altar. But he just said, oh, I'm not sure what happened. I threw it in the fire and boom, out came this calf. Nonsense. He's not taking responsibility for himself and for the people. So Moses saw that Aaron had let the people get completely out of control, much to the amusement of their enemies. So he stood at the entrance to the, to the camp and shouted, All of you who are on the Lord's side, come here and join me. And all the Levites gathered around him. Moses told them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Each of you take your swords and go back and forth from one end of the camp to the other, and kill everyone, even your brothers, friends, and neighbors. The Levites obeyed Moses' command, and about 3,000 people died that day. Then Moses told the Levites, Today you have ordained yourselves for the service of the Lord, for you have obeyed him, even though it meant killing your own sons and brothers. Today you have earned a blessing. So this is where the Levites come in, right? Up to this point, it's been Aaron, He's been, he's been uh, you know, priest before God, and now the Levites find a very special service to God 
um, in this moment because they they make a decision. Moses said, anybody who's with the Lord and you're going to move away from the pagan worship and you come over here on my side and the Levite clan, evidently they were being led by godly Levites, were, were led by those who were godly and they wanted to serve God. And so they come over to that side and Moses says, okay, it's time for these people who have chosen, they've chosen, they've, they've chosen to worship these false gods. Some of them have to be put to death. And so that's what they do. Now it says in Exodus 32, 30, the next day Moses said to the people, you have committed a terrible sin, but I will go back up to the Lord on the mountain. Perhaps I will be able to obtain forgiveness for your sin. It's a pretty incredible leader. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, oh, what a terrible sin these people have committed. They have made gods of gold for themselves. But now if you will only forgive their sin, but if not, erase my name from the record you've written. But the Lord replied to Moses, no, I will re erase the name of everyone who has sinned against me. Now go lead the people to the place I told you about. Look, my angel will lead the way before you. And when I come to call the people to the account, I will certainly hold them responsible for their sins. Then the Lord sent a great plague upon the people because they had worshiped the calf Aaron had made. So there's this accountability that happens. And in inference, you know, those people who even today, they hide behind grace. There are plenty of people who hide behind grace. Uh, they hide behind, you know, Jesus dying on the cross for their sins, and they use grace as a license for sin. And I promise you, I promise you, we're not talking about people who, you know, who who are battling with temptation, who really sincerely love Jesus, and they, they're they just battling with it. No, we're talking about people who are using grace as a license to sin and, and you know, would, would you know, give themselves to the, the, the heresy of antinomianism, which antinomianism is the heresy that says, well, you know what, I'm, I'm saved, doesn't matter what I do, once saved, always saved, there's no consequence for sin left whatsoever, because I've got a blank check. Uh, let me tell you, friends, those people who believe that, they are being fed heresy, because God's people, God's own people, the people he made covenant with, with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they they forsake God, forsook God and they turned away from the worship of the one true God back to the God of the Egyptians, right? And and God says, I'm going to erase the name of everyone who sinned against me. And he said, I will certainly hold them responsible for their sins. And those people, again, you find this over and over throughout the scripture. First Timothy chapter two, Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter six, Romans speaks of this reality that, you know, if we, if we continue in our sin and deliberate disobedience, that there is nothing but judgment left for those. And, uh, and, and I'm telling you, we need to understand that those people who are teaching opposite of that, they're leading people astray. Okay. So he says, I will certainly hold them responsible for their sins. And he sends a plague and he wipes them, many of them out. Okay, then the Lord said to Moses, get going, you and the people you brought up from the land of Egypt. Go up to the land I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I told them, I will give this land to your descendants, and I will send an angel before you to drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perivites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to this land that flows with milk and honey. But I will not travel among you, for you are a stubborn and rebellious people. If I did... I would surely destroy you along the way. And when the people heard these stern words, they went into mourning and stopped wearing the jewelry and fine clothes. For the Lord had told Moses to tell them, you are stubborn and rebellious people. If I were to travel with you for even a moment, I would destroy you. Remove your jewelry and fine clothing while you decide what to do. So from that time on, they left Mount Sinai. The Israelites wore no more jewelry or fine clothes. And it's an interesting response, isn't it? God says, you know what? You're more captured with the jewelry and the clothes than you are with me. It's time for you to shape up, get rid of those stuff and turn to me because you, you've got your priorities wrong. And, and so he's, he's saying to them, you know, I, if I traveled with you even for a day, 
you know, I'd end up having to destroy you because your your priorities are all screwed up, and you in the world the world's got a hold of your heart. And and I honestly believe I think that that would be the message that God would give to a lot of people who claim to be Christ followers today. He'd say, you know, if I traveled with you even for a day, I'd have to destroy you because your heart is in the wrong place. Get rid of those things. Set those things aside. Take the jewelry off. Take take the you know the fine clothes. Quit quit focusing your life on those things that the rest of the world measures themselves by and get your heart right back, right with God. And that's what God would say. And it says, it says this, it was Moses's practice to take the, take the tent of meeting and set it up some distance from the camp. And everyone who wanted to make a request of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent of meeting, all the people would get up and stand in the entrances of their own tents. And they would all watch Moses until he disappeared inside and he's went into the as he went into the tent the pillar of cloud would come down and hover at its entrance while the lord spoke to moses when the people saw the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent they would stand and bow down in front of their own tents inside the tent of meeting the lord would speak to moses face to face as one speaks to a friend Afterward, Moses would return to the camp, but the young man who assisted him, Joshua, the son of Nun, would remain behind in the tent of meeting. That really, that's one of the, I, this chapter right here is one of the most incredible to me. I just get this picture of Moses being in the tent of meeting and the people watching and recognizing that Moses had been in the presence of God, that this cloud had come down and they'd watch. And even when Moses would disappear into the tent, they would outside of their own tents, they would bow down because they just recognized that th this holy moment where their leader was meeting with God. And, and, and I love this reality. And they, they would, they would, then they would worship God and they would recognize the presence of God was there in the camp. Right. And then even when Moses was done, this is so cool that, uh, that Joshua got to experience this with God. See, Joshua is going to be the one who takes over after Moses passes away. And Joshua is going to be the one that takes the Israeli people into the promised land. And Joshua had the opportunity to be uh, to, to be mentored and be, be brought into the presence of God with Moses. When Moses would leave, Joshua would linger. And he would just linger and he'd wait and he'd stay there in the tent of meeting, continuing to soak it in what it is that God had, the, the, just the presence of God that had been there, even after the cloud had gone. Even after Moses had stepped out, Joshua would linger. Um, oh, that people would linger. Just hang out a little bit longer. Desire the presence of God a little bit more. Revel in the fact that God came and met. What incredible um, message for us. All right, let's keep going. Exodus 33. One day Moses said to the Lord, you've been telling me, take these people up to the promised land, but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. You've told me, I know you by name, and I look favorably on you. If it is true that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways so may I might understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And remember that this nation is your very own people. And the Lord replied, I will go with you, Moses. I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. And then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. How will anyone know that you look favorably on me, on me and on your people, if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all the other people on the earth. And the Lord replied to Moses, I will indeed do what you have asked, for I look favorably on you, and I know you by name. And Moses responded, then show me your glorious presence. And the Lord, Lord replied, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will call out my name, Yahweh, before you. For I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose, but you and not look directly at my face, for no one may see me and live. And the Lord continued, look, stand near me on this rock. As my glorious presence passes by, I will hide you in the crevice of the rock 
and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will, will remove my hand and let you see me from behind, but my face will not be seen. And yet this is one of the most amazing moments for Moses. And, and Moses is just like, Lord, I know that you, you know, I know you by, you know, you've told me, I know you by name and I look favorably on you. But he, he says, you know, I, I love this request. He said, let me know your ways. So may I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. That's a prayer that we can make. I, you please underline that in verse 13. Let me know your ways so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. That's what I was saying. We need to, we need to get the big details of God, about who God is so that we can know him more fully. Why? So that we can continue to enjoy his favor. You want to enjoy the favor of God, get to know God better. You know him more, know his character more, know who he is, know what he's doing, know what the Bible is all about, this big narrative. It's got one, one thread all throughout. It's the thread of redemption. It's because we have a God who is holy and he's gracious. He is just, he is holy. He, he, there will be a payment for sin. There will always be a payment for sin. And Christ has come to redeem us. He's come to atone for us. He's come to destroy the works of the devil. He has come to destroy sin altogether. Not just to patch it, not just to put a band-aid on it. He's the same God who's come to forgive us, also desires to give us power over sin. Okay, and that's what Moses said. God, help me to know you more. And the more we get to know God, man, the better it is, the more favor we have with him. And I, I, that's my prayer. I hope that's your prayer. God, help me to know you more. Okay, and, and, and God says, I, I will indeed do what you've asked for I look favorably on you and I do, I know you by name. And this is one of the, this is one of the worship songs that we sing. A lot of people are down on modern worship and they're like, oh, give me the old hymns. And ah, the old hymns are fine too, but the modern worship is just as good. Show me your glory. That's it. When we sing that song, show me your glory, show me your glory. Guess what? We're saying the same thing Moses did. We're singing the same thing as saying, show me your glory, God. Okay. So, so, so much of the modern worship is just rooted in, in scripture, just as much as the old hymns are. All right. And then, uh, then the Lord says, I, I will make my goodness pass before you and you call up my name, Yahweh, you know, and we get to see God. We don't get to see him face to face, but we get to see God. We'll get to know him when we get to heaven, even better. Exodus 34. Then the Lord told Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones. I will write on them the same words that were on the tablets you smashed. Be ready in the morning to climb up Mount Sinai and present yourself to me on the t top of the mountain. Excuse me. No one else may come with you. In fact, no one is to appear anywhere on the mountain. Do not even let the flocks or herds graze near the mountain. So Moses chiseled out two st tablets of stone like the first ones early in the morning. He climbed Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, and he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. And then the Lord came down in a cloud stood there with him and he called out his his own name, Yahweh. And the Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and the grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. Listen, that, that whole paragraph, you need to underline it. You need to mark it you need, because it's true. It's still true today because it's the true of who God is. Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion, the God of mercy, slow to anger, filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love. Look, check this out. To a thousand generations. Un, I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. Right? And he lays on the sins of the, of the parents upon the, the, It continues on. Listen, God says, I lay it on their children and their grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even to the th third and fourth generation. And we see that, right? We see this reality of those who do not take responsibility for their sin. They do not truly, genuinely confess their sin, repent from it. What ends up happening? They end up seeing it repeated through generations. 
It's different though when it's broken. God can break the curse of the, the family curse, but it comes through repentance. And that's what happens. It's a you, you guarantee you you want to you want to bring bad things down on your children. Re, don't repent of your sin. Don't repent of your sin, and you'll see it passed down to second, third generation to your children and your grandchildren and your great grandchildren. But the only way of breaking that is through true repentance, forgiveness, and and the change that God brings in a person's heart. And then that they, that that is broken. That generational curse is broken. All right. Moses immediately threw himself to the ground and worshipped, and he said, "Oh Lord, if it is true that I have found favor with you, then please travel with us. Yes, this is a stubborn and rebellious people, but please forgive our iniquity and our sins. Claim us as your own special possession." The Lord replied, listen, I'm making a covenant with you in the presence of all your people. This is the Mosaic covenant. Okay, this is another one of those covenants. Abrahamic covenant, Mosaic covenant. It says, I'm making a covenant with you. Um, I will perform miracles that have never been performed anywhere in all the earth or in any nation. And all the people around you will see the power of the Lord, the awesome power I will display on you. But listen carefully to everything I command you today. Then I will go ahead of you. Drive out the Amorites, Canaanites, Hittites, Perivites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Be very careful never to make a treaty with the people who live in the land you're going. If you do, you will follow their evil ways and be trapped. Instead, you must break down their pagan altars, smash their sacred pillars, and cut down their Asherah poles. You must worship no other gods for the Lord whose very name is jealous, is a God who is jealous about his relationship with you. You must not make a treaty of any kind with the people living in the land. They lust after their gods, offering sacrifices to them. They will invite you to join them in their sacrificial meals, and you will go with them. Then you will accept their daughters who sacrifice to other gods as wives for your sons, and they will seduce your sons to commit adultery against me. By worshiping other gods, you must not make any gods of molten metal for yourself. You must celebrate the festival of unleavened bread. For seven days, the bread you eat must be made without yeast, just as I commanded you. Celebrate this festival annually at the appointed time in the early spring in the month of Abib, for that is the anniversary of your departure from Egypt. The firstborn of every male animal belongs to me including the firstborn males from your herds of cattle and your flocks of sheep and goats. A firstborn donkey may be bought back from the Lord by presenting a lamb or young goat in its place. But if you do not buy it back, you must break its neck. However, you must buy back every firstborn son. No one may appear before me without an offering. Hear that? No one may appear before me without an offering. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but on the seventh day, you must stop working, even during the seasons of plowing and harvest. You must celebrate the festival of harvest with the first crop of the wheat harvest and celebrate the festival of the final harvest at the end of the harvest season. Three times each year, every man in Israel must appear before the sovereign, the Lord, the God of Israel. I will drive out the other nations ahead of you and expand your territory. So no one will covet and conquer your land while you appear before the Lord your God three times each year. You must not offer the blood of my sacrificial offerings together with any baked goods containing yeast. And none of the meat of the Passover sacrifice may be kept over until the next morning. As you harvest your crops, bring the very best of the first harvest to the house of the Lord your God. You must not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. Then the Lord said to Moses, write down all these instructions, for they represent the terms of the covenant I am making with you and with Israel. Moses remained there on the mountain with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. And in all that time, he ate no bread and he drank no water. And the Lord wrote the terms of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, on stone tablets. And when Moses came down Mount Sinai, carrying the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, he wasn't aware that his face had become radiant because he had spoken to the Lord. So when Aaron and the people of Israel saw the radiance of Moses' face, they were afraid to come near him. Well, Moses called out to them and asked Aaron and all the leaders of the community to come over, and he talked with them. And then all the people of Israel approached him 
And Moses gave them all the instructions the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses finished speaking with them, he covered his face with a veil. But whenever he went into the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord, he would remove the veil until he came out again. And then he would give the people whatever instructions the Lord had given him. And the people of Israel would see the radiant glow of his, feet, of his face. So he would put the veil over his face until he returned to speak with the Lord. Yeah, the good news is, is we've all been encouraged to come boldly before the throne of grace and to, to get to know God better and spend time with him like Moses spends time in the tent of meeting. And because of that, there would be a radiant glow on his face. And I, and I would say this, the more we spend time with God, <laughs> the more there's a radiant glow on our faces. If we would just carve out the time and spend time with him, like we're doing, reading the word, like we're doing, praying. You know, spend time with God because the radiance of God will just uh, will, will be on you. Um, he'll bring peace into your heart. He'll bring peace into your life. He'll bring peace, in, peace into your mind. And, uh, and, and, and people will be able to see the radiance of the presence of God over you. Yeah, let's see God. Let's get to know him. Let's see him, um, you know, face to face like Moses did. We've been invited into the presence of God. All right, let's pray together. God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, for giving us a picture of what it can be like uh, to know you, what it can be like to really truly walk with you, um, to have forgiveness of our sins, to be cleansed, but also to seek you and to know you. Uh, God, to be yours, um, to be to be bought back, to be saved from from being a prisoner to sin. Um, to uh, to being um, a child of God and one who has been uh, changed. God, thank you, thank you, Lord, that uh, that God, this is just such a good picture for us. That there are people in the community who uh, they were along for the ride, and they were along for the journey to uh, the promised land, but they were not uh, walking close with you, and then. And then there were those who, you know, like the Levites and Moses and Joshua, who, who would linger in the presence of God, who took it, took the invitation um, as a as a very personal and uh, privileged invitation uh, to be able to worship you and to be able to know you and grow closer to you. And God, I pray that you would help us to live just conscious of this privilege we have to know you. God, I pray for each person who's reading with me. Lord, no matter where they've been in the past, maybe some even have been kind of in a season where they've been out of fellowship with you. And God, they're looking for a way back. And Lord, I thank you that, God, you give us the invitation, Lord, to come back to you, to know you, to draw close to you. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would help them to see that they can have a season where they, uh, a new season of life, this new covenant in the same way that you made this Mosaic covenant with, uh, with, with Moses and with, with any of that, anybody that would respond that, that God, if they would follow you, if they would, if they would honor you, if they would worship you, if they would choose to choose you instead of making you know, all of these connections with the, with the pagan world, um, God, that they would uh, live within your favor. Help us, Lord, to, to choose you. Help us to turn our back on the world, not on the people of the world and reaching out to them, but turning our back on the things of the world and the love of the world and the, uh, all of the attachments that we make. Help us, Lord, to, to, to break those, to, to no longer be owned by the world, but to be owned by you, that you would have our heart. So God, I thank you for each one that's reading with me today. God, may you lead them into your presence. May they know you better. I thank you, Lord, that I get to read with them. And may your blessing rest on them. Thank you, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, thanks for joining me today. Um, you know, again, I hope that you have a, a, a great day. Uh, today um, in the Lord, and we'll see you tomorrow. God bless you.